Lewis Lake, modelled in ON30 gauge and exhibited by Alan Aitken. The real Lewis Lake is in the US state of Wyoming, in the southern part of the Yellowstone National Park. The Lewis River is the lake's primary inflow, draining south from Shoshone Lake. The primary outflow of Lewis Lake is also the Lewis River, continuing south to join the Snake River near the southern boundary of Yellowstone National Park. The Lewis Lake layout is an ON30 layout representing a fictitious dock town at the north end of Lewis Lake, Wyoming, between 1890 and 1910. The town takes in hunters and tourists from the south by boat and provides lodgings and supplies before moving them north to Yellowstone Park. The small town has a thriving fish industry, with the lake being well stocked. With the amount of people moving through the town, small industries have managed to get established. Scale and Compass Hardware and Aitkin Foods are always busy, and Bowman Blacksmiths are kept going maintaining the railroad stock and local needs. The layout is operated using the ECOS digital command control system and the hands-free control module. All switches are controlled by servos and operated by a switch control panel. The buildings are super detailed with every building and room filled with detail, lights and people as it would have been in real life. There's lots to see. Um, I'm here now on a, an N-gauge track called Roxbury Town and I'm here with Martin who can uh, hopefully give me a bit more information on what, what, what the layout's all about. What was the inspiration behind the, the layout, Martin? Basically just to put something that's pleasing on the eye, something that's with this S-shape, it just looks better when you're running the trains and the split levels, everybody always seems to like the split levels. It's based on a freelance design the buildings from Scunthorpe at the other end. We've changed it a little bit this year. We've put the power station in, and we put the Premier in and the tax office from Scunthorpe at that end. But uh, basically we don't do a lot to it, to be honest. It just runs forever and we love, love operating it. So it's bang up to date as we can, basically. We have all the new repaints that come out. It's 12, 12 foot, yeah, by about... And how many boards is that? Just three. And it's very easy to put up, it's what we call plug and play. It's all self-contained within the, the actual baseboards and just the connector leads to put in. So we can knock it down in about half an hour at the end of the day, so it's dead easy. It sits in a cradle in the car. Um, was it DCC or DC? It's DC, all on, you can see on the uh, control panel there, it's all isolators. And how many operators would you normally have on it? Normally have three on. So one on the up and down lines and then somebody operates the yard. Uh, what about your, your scenery? What's that, scratch built? Or? Premier Inn, that's a bespoke build for us. It's Pico sheds on the on the actual shed itself. And these are bespoke. I think Jeff made the uh, the back scene ones here. The scenery is set as autumn, which we like. Just something different to everybody else, really. I notice it's not actually on a level. Is there, there is an incline on the, on the track, is it? Down to the uh, shed, yeah. But that gives it that pleasing look on the eye sort of thing as you're going down the slope into the sheds. It's all like mainly farish, is it? Or yeah, a bit of depot, a bit of revolution. Just whatever runs well for us, basically. So. And uh, your track work, what, what's that? It's all standard Pico straight out of the box. And we found it runs superb for us. We, uh, and your points, what are they? They're all Pico with po or standard Pico point motors underneath. Again, they give us brilliant service. Great, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, appreciate it. So you join me now um, at a, a layout called Canal Side Ironworks. This is a, a 150th scale uh, layout. I'm going to ask uh, David now to uh, explain a little bit more about the, the whole uh, ethos behind the scale and everything else? I'm very much in the industry so I'm, a, I'm more of an industrial enthusiast than a railway modeler so it was an industrial scene that I wanted to create but you need movement to be get invited to model railway exhibitions so hence we've got a railway but the majority of the model 
is industrial. Can you tell me a little bit more about the scale and the choice of, of that uh, for your layout? The scale is 150th to the a uh, 150th scale, which is six millimetres to the foot. It's in between double O and O gauge. Double O is four millimetres, O gauge is seven millimetres. And it isn't exactly a recognised scale in railway modelling as such. But there are one or two modellers such as myself that do do this. American modellers, they were modelled to 148 scale, which is very similar to what I'm in here, you see. The chassis that I use are actually N-gauge chassis, and the track is also N-gauge, which is 9 millimetres between the rails. So the, the trucks and, and locos are all hand-built, are they? Some are, well, quite a lot are hand-built, quite a lot are just adapted from other whatever, and the actual, most of the rolling stock is kit, kit built. You can find kits that are adaptable, not exactly in this scale, but they're adaptable and they'll look right. Some of the bodies that I actually used are chopped up double O bodies, such as the one that's sitting outside the workshop now. That's from the Triang range, which was what they were called Nelly and Polly and those. So you can often chop bodies up and make what you want, you see. How big is it? The layout itself, it's about seven foot long, roughly. And how many boards is that? It's got three boards, but then there's also the fourth, which is the co control panel. And what about the, the, the scenery? Is that all hand-built? Yes, all the scenery is, is hand-built. The windows and such as that, I purchased those, but uh, all the buildings are scratch-built. They're basically plywood, and it's plaster on plywood and then scribed. Each individual brick is painted whatever colour, I use around about 14 different colours and then I dust it with artist chalk or weathering powders. The slates on the roofs, they're all pieces of card, all cut up and laid individually and the walls that you can see is actual shale which is all cut up and again laid one piece at a time. A labour of love. Yes, <laughs> they haven't exactly locked me away yet <laughs> but it's not far away. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Thanks for your time. This double O gauge layout, Montague Field, is a portrait of a forlorn mid 1950s industrial railway set on the northeast coast of England between the rivers Tyne and Weir. The quayside layout in an unspecified location on the historic coast of County Durham was inspired by books of the northeast region and the London and North East Region Railways. The layout scenic area is built onto two 4 foot 6 inch by 2 foot boards but has an extension at the front bringing the overall size to 9 feet by 3 foot 6. A major feature of the layout is dockside cranes built from Airfix DAPOL kits. Buildings were scratch built with stonework and cobbles produced by hand scribing DIY filler. The coal staves were cut in batches from balsa wood and then held in place with pins on a jig. Much of the layout stock was built from kits, detailed and weathered, and fitted with B&B couplings. Some ready-to-run models have been added after modification and weathering. Although mostly freight traffic, a Class 101 DMU operates a limited passenger service. Wikwa, modelled in N-Gage and exhibited by Farnham and District Model Railway Club. Wikwa is a small town on the important secondary main line between Bristol and Gloucester, modelled as it was around the early 1950s. The Bristol and Gloucester Railway was built under the guidance of Brunel as broad gauge, opened in 1844. The GWR expected to buy it, but in 1845 the Midland outbid them, breaking the GWR's monopoly of Bristol. As well as local trains, there were many long distance expresses with destinations such as Bournemouth, Manchester, Bradford and Newcastle. Goods trains were mostly to or from Bristol or Avonmouth docks. Motive power was mainly LMR tender locos, 
e.g. 4Fs, Jubilees and Black Fives, with a few GWR and later LNER locos. We aim to produce a typical selection of trains and stock for the time. To the southwest, left as seen, the line comes out of a tunnel and along the side of a valley. To the northeast right, it starts to cross the valley. There is a 30 metre height difference between the highest and lowest points modelled, 8 inches in N gauge. So open plan baseboards have been used, built from styrofoam, sandwiched between three layers of gaboon ply. Styrofoam has also been used for the scenery, covered with a layer of sculptor mould. All the buildings are scratch built, mainly from printouts of photographs of the current buildings. The station building, designed by Brunel, was unique due to the narrow space. Next to the tunnel is a large brewery, built by the railway company to replace existing breweries whose water supply the tunnel cut through. At the period modelled it had become a cider factory, which later closed but has now reopened as the Wickwa Brewing Company. The back scene was photoshopped from photographs of the real location and printed on vinyl. Lorries and buses run along the front using the Fala moving vehicle system and internal batteries, with a taxi rank at one end storing up to four vehicles. The vehicles are controlled from a tablet connected by Wi-Fi and RFID is used to identify and display where vehicles are. The lady at the station puts her arm out to stop the bus. Each of the two tracks can operate on DC or DCC, selected when the layout is set up. The small goods yard only had one train per day. To do any shunting necessitated blocking both main lines. The fiddle yard has three roads in each direction, each divided into sections so that 24 plus trains can be stored. The movement of trains in the fiddle yard is automated using Merg Train on Track TOTI detectors which work with both DC and DCC. The boards and control panels are operated via a Merg CBUS system. Point signals on the car system are controlled by servo motors in Merg mounts. The signals are operated automatically as trains pass. Video cameras display views of the layout on screens at each end. RFID is used to automate whistle signals. A third of the time the lights are turned down to provide a dusk running mode. Trains have illuminated head and tail lights and illuminated carriages. Lighted signals and several of the buildings and buses with headlights. Bridgewater s and JR modelled in O gauge and exhibited by Trevor Gibson. The line from Bridgewater to Eddington was opened on the 21st of July 1890 built by an independent company, the Bridgewater Railway Company. The station building was built of local brick and had the appearance of an LSWR design. The good yard, complete with shed, had facilities to handle many commodities including coal, bricks, tiles and livestock. A single road engine shed of brick construction was also built, together with a 50-foot turntable. The shed, although extended in 1898 to accommodate two locomotives, was not used to stable locomotives overnight. Up until 1942 there was a 1056 yard extension from the cattle dock that swung through 180 degrees to provide access to the brickworks and wharf facility and the east bank of the River Parrot. The layout is set in the Edwardian period of 1904, with all the stock being modified kit or scratch-built items representative of the glorious Prussian blue days of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. The buildings and structures are accurate models of the prototypes, built from drawings and photographs and are scratch-built from laser-cut NBF and Plasticard. Operations are to a sequence representing in compressed form a typical day's working on the branch during the golden age of the S&D JR. Bridgewater features as Railway of the Month in Railway Modeler in October and November 2019. 
St. Marnock Engine Shed, modelled in O-Gage and exhibited by Mike Bissett. St. Marnock Engine Shed depicts a typical Glasgow and South Western Railway Depot, providing servicing facilities for locomotives using the Anglo-Scottish route through Kilmarnock. It features the distinctive Galloway architecture, so reminiscent of the sheds at Eyre, Hurlford and Dumfries. Unusually for a small depot, it has a 70-foot turntable capable of handling the largest express locomotives. St. Marnock Engine Shed is DCC controlled and all the locomotives are sound fitted with some having smoke units. OK, so you join us now on the layout Yorkshire Pennines, which is an N-gauge layout and I'm here with Roland. What was the inspiration behind it? Well, we've seen a, a, a layout before that uh, operated on two levels, N-gauge, uh, and was visible, you know, viewed from the full 360 degrees. And we rather like that, so um, they say the best, fo best form of flattery is imitation, so we had a go at doing it ourselves, although we kept it a bit small. This is 10 foot by 5 foot, this one, and it's that size, so it fits in my garage at home. Um, what sort of era is it set in? Uh, post 2000, a little bit of uh, operator's license here, you know, modeler's license here. Uh, we cheat a little bit. The top layout is the top circuit, are uh, uh, supposed to be a preserved railway, and the lower, the lower track is, is main line. Uh, and as in real world, there's access between the two, uh, and so you, we can see a little bit of movement to and from the two, le two different levels. One end of the curve is our fiddle yard, if you want, so it's visible and it's scenic. Fascinated by the, uh, the, the screens, the computer screens that you've got here. Can you tell me a little bit about those? OK, uh, we, it is obviously a DCC uh, layout. All the N-gauge locos have, have their own sounds. Uh, what we wanted to do was show really how the hobby is moving forward into the 21st century. So now uh, there's lots of different computer systems that can drive model railways. We've chosen one here. Uh, and the idea was uh, to show uh, visitors to the shows just what is now available. So we're using the computer to help us drive 11 trains simultaneously on the layout. The idea being there's something always moving. The control system is Digitrax DCC, just the same as uh, a, a, it's a regular uh, DCC system and the computer just adds to that it's rather think about it as a, a rather sophisticated throttle so as well as the normal throttles for, for driving the locals then the, you just plug the computer in with its software and that takes over as, as a uh, just as a throttle would the only thing is of course the computer can do more than one thing at once more than we humans can cope so that's why we can get so many things moving at once on the layout here there's 51 points and if you were trying to drive from each individual track, you have to obviously look ahead and make sure your points are changed. By the time you've done that, this train's been stationary for a while. And once again, visitors are saying nothing's moving. But once again, the computer can do things far faster than we can. It can change all the points, blink of an eye, and drive the trains all at the same time. And what about operation? It looks like it's just one man that can operate. It can be just one man. Uh, brother Steve's doing it now. Uh, and all he is doing is telling the computer to start whatever timetable he, he's picked. However, we can tell the computer just to do half the layout and we can control the other half with normal throttles. And we, we do that on a regular basis and we let visitors you know, drive part of the layout whilst the computer's driving the other half. The clever thing is that the software will wait for you as you, travel, as you drive your train manually it'll pause its operation if one of your trains is in its way. When we're at a show, you'll, you'll probably notice this as you place chairs, uh, that we can actually uh, sing out to him. But you can also probably see there's a mirror above the layout. So Steve can sit there and he, actually, he can actually see the far side of the layout, no problems at all. And if something goes wrong when you have to show, the visiting public normally say, you've got a problem over here, you know. But they keep you informed, don't they? And the scenics, what are, is that scratch built or kit? Yeah, it's all, all scratch built. I, well, I say all, there's three, I think four um, single boxes that are from the box. Everything else is scratch built, and that's thanks to um, uh, Aiken Models in York. 
Oh yeah. A member of the club, and he's uh, he's built all these, and they're, they're taken from photographs and real real plans. So that's Robin Hood's Bay uh, uh, station building up there. Thank you very much. I appreciate appreciate your uh, your, your time. No problems at all. Blair Athol towards Dromocta by the Scottish Diesel and Electric Group it was modelled in double O gauge. When you visit a model railway show, there is usually one or two standout layouts. For me, this layout was the star of the show. Blair Athol towards Dromocta is a scale replica of the Highland Perthshire village of Blair Athol and the railway northward to Dromocta summit. Set in early autumn, an overnight snowfall has brought delays to traffic on the A9 near Dromocta, with the northbound route temporarily closed pending clearance by snowplough. Fortunately, rail transport is unaffected at this time, with all services running normally. The model picks up the Highland Main Line as it enters Blair Athol under bridge 86H, which gives local access to the golf course. From here it heads over the ornate lattice river tilt viaduct and past Blair Athol's signal box and level crossing. The route north was redoubled in 1978 from here to Dalwini, and shortly after leaving the station trains pass under an estate bridge adjacent to Blair Castle West Lodge, cross the River Garry and under the A9 viaduct before turning onto the northbound climb. Blair Athol Village has been modelled to the exact OS map detail with replicas of the famous Athol Arms Hotel and Tully Bardeen Institute. Due to planning restrictions imposed by Athol Estate, very little of the village has changed over the years. The layout is now in its 34th year and has been extensively refurbished since 2015. So you join me now on Falcon Road, which is an O-gauge layout, and I'm here with Ian. What was the inspiration behind the layout, Ian? It started with uh, my previous layout, which was called Haymarket Cross, which was a double O layout, and I did one of the worst things possible. I went and bought an O-gauge A4, because I always wanted one, and I thought, oh no, I've got to start now and go over to O-gauge. So eventually sold the, sold the uh, double O layout and started collecting the the locomotives that we see here today and decided to build another layout that was literally based on the Haymarket Cross idea. Um, what, what era is it set in? We've, I've done it in an era that I remember well as a train spotter back in the early 60s, 61, 62, which was the transition, start of the transition period where you've got your diesels coming in, get all your new diesels like the Deltics and the Class 40s, the rolling stocks all based on the eastern and northeastern region of British Railways in the early 60s. I last saw this layout um, 2020 in Doncaster and um, since then it's grown a bit. Can you tell me what, what you've added to it? What, what we've done is uh, through the, the two years of Covid where we were locked, locked down literally I decided that I was going to build a small shed at one end of the layout so I took one of the fiddle yards off that we had at one end and replaced it with three more boards and we built a two road northeastern pattern engine shed and it's, it's, it's basically a stabling point for the steam and diesel locos. The idea was as well we've, we've, uh, we already had a, a, a tunnel on the layout that runs from one end to the other it was for allowing locos to be sent back without having to be turned or anything at the other end so we use that now for the freight trains. We have a couple of freight trains that we run. One is a coal train and one is some, uh, some box vans. And we go to a siding at the far end of the shed and then another loco couples up on the, on the back and pulls it all the way back down the tunnel where people can't see it, back to the other end where the fiddle yard is. With the extension, how big is it now? The whole length is 32 foot. And how many boards was that one? There's, I think there's eight boards. What is it, DCC or DC? It's, uh, it's full DCC, uh, Digitracks, and um, we're using um, Tortoise point motors, which can be operated either via the handset 
uh, or by push buttons. At the moment, we, we're using it as, as handsets because we don't have a lot of points. I think this in the shed area, I think there's about five or six lots of points, but some of them are double points, but work together. So with the handsets, do you, uh, do you have operators at both ends then? Yes, we, we can operate the layout from both ends. In the middle, we've put sockets on the front of the layout as well, so that uh, what we try to do is get, especially children, we try to get those involved in running the trains when, when, uh, when they come to have a look. We try to get them having a go at moving the locos, sounding the whistles or the horns on the diesels, and the children love it when they can have a go and see how to work the digital layout. Rolling stock, um, we've got we've got some kit built locomotives, uh, DJH uh, Gladiator, and one or two others that I'm not quite sure of the manufacturer, but the. Uh, most of the Pacifics that I've got are um, LH Loveless, uh, Golden Age models, 55H and Fine Scale Brass. Fine Scale Brass 55H are the same, same people, uh, John Riley who, who runs that, uh, great guy to deal with. Um, one of the last ones I've had is uh, Britannia, which I had to wait 18 months for, you had to order it in advance. And then John wanted to know exactly which one you wanted. So when it was manufactured in Korea, it was the exact right tender on it, the right smoke deflectors. And it's a beautiful local. They are really nicely made. All the scenics are scratch built. My own ideas for terrace houses. Uh, I made the signal box based on one that I saw in East Yorkshire, on the, which, which is a northeastern pattern one. The cars we've got on there are a, a mixture of different ones, the 143rd scale cars, but I've got, at one end, I've got me, uh, I've got a, a, a Lotus and Morgan garage in honour of my late brother who used to restore Morgans for a living. I used to have a Lotus and we used to always be at each other's, <laughs> having a go at each other about which is the best cars. So I've done, a, I've done a garage with his name on it and I've filled it with Lotuses and Morgans. And a lot of people are really interested in it as well when they come and look at it. Great, okay, thanks Ian. I mean, I really appreciate that.